talented detective chief inspector named Phil Cuthbert met an old friend of Simmons at a Masonic function. Cuthbert, um, bless you, come running into my office the next day and uh, as we said, you've been telling Porky's governor, you know, and I said, well, um, what's up, Phil? And he said, you're on the square, and then he mentioned the guy's name. And I either had to make him appear a liar, and I said, okay, Phil, um, I am a Freemason, um, but it doesn't cut any ice. That makes no difference to me. Uh, as far as the job is concerned, that's outside the job. And um, he said, fine, you know, it's lovely. He shook my hand and so pleased to know and everything like that. And within minutes uh, and during the next course of a few days, all the chaps that had tried to approach me, they all come in with sort of smirky smiles and sort of said, oh, you know, uh, uh, so pleased to know you're uh, on the square. And I said to everybody, it makes no difference. Um, the job will be done as it should be done and it has no bearing, uh, uh, and nobody said anything to the contrary, but um, it obviously wasn't um, taken on board of what I'd said. Simmons' fellow mason, Phil Cuthbert, now asked if he could have a quiet word on the square. Simmons guessed this meant Cuthbert wanted to confide his crooked role in the robberies on the Masonic understanding that nothing would be revealed to anyone else. But Simmons was not prepared to treat confidentially any criminal admission. So he went to his meeting with Cuthbert with a concealed tape recorder. They met in a pub in Artillery Passage where Cuthbert talked for three hours about senior detectives and their collusion in the recent robberies. He was also recklessly frank about his own role. I think Phil took Freemasonry in a very serious vein and he believed that as I was a, uh, now an accepted uh, brother that he could talk to me under those lines and um, you know, many uh, Freemasons take the, uh, uh, the craft very, very seriously, like a religion, uh, and that um, it's sacrosanct to them. And I think that he felt that he could talk to me under that vein and that I would not let him down. Simmons' evidence formed the heart of the case against Cuthbert in his 1982 trial for taking up to £80,000 in bribes. He was sentenced to three years in prison. But the man who gave evidence against him now became a Masonic outcast. I went to uh, um, a meeting in the Connaught Rooms, which after all, I'm sure most people know, is virtually the, the headquarters of uh, British Freemasonry. And the chap that I'd known for many, many years um, uh, was there. Officer. a police officer and uh, a Freemason. And uh, 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 we saw, we caught eye across, I suppose, uh, uh, twice the distant time sitting from you and he just stared at me and just shook his head like that and um, run his, uh, his finger across the throat. I thought, gosh, what am I doing here? Um, I need to get out of this place because um, if one man can do that, I, I need to get out. But what exactly did that gesture mean? Well, it's part of uh, if one uh, reaches Freemasonry, then uh, you take certain oaths, and one of them is that you'd rather have your throat cut than to um, divulge secrets of uh, Freemasonry. The sign is given by drawing the hand smartly across the throat and dropping it to the side. This is an allusion to the symbolic penalty at one time included in the degree, which implied that as a man of honor, a Mason would rather have his throat cut across and improperly disclose the secret... I don't think anybody very seriously believes that these threats will be carried out. But uh, this doesn't detract from the psychological force of it. There's nothing like fear to instill loyalty. But I think even more powerful is the other fact that comes out in, in the ritual, where they say not only will these appalling things happen to you physically, but you will be cast out from us in every other way. In other words, if you betray the Freemasons, you're like the bloke who runs away in wartime, the chap who lets the regiment down, the one who lets the side down, who suddenly becomes the total outsider, the strike breaker who's sent to Coventry for 20 years. In other words, they say, we're the most important thing in your life. We never spoke. Uh, that, you know, uh, uh, words and actions, and uh, it wasn't an idle gesture. It was one um, I took in, in the way in which he meant it. John Simmons resigned from his lodge, dismayed at the gap between Freemasonry's high principles and their often shady practice. You agree to be a good man and true, and strictly to obey the moral law. You are to be a peaceable subject, and cheerfully to conform to the laws of the country in which you reside. 
As portrayed in the Freemasons' own video, these moral principles are read out to every lodge master at his installation. But apparently too many Masons stray far from the Masonic ideal. Leonard John Gibson is a case in point. In 1979, Gibson was installed as master of the Waterways Lodge, which meets at the Southgate Masonic Centre in North London. He had reached this rank just seven years after his initiation. But masonry was not Gibson's only interest. At that time, Scotland Yard's flying squad was circulating a confidential handbook of London's top 100 violent thieves, among them worshipful master Len Gibson. On one page was his mugshot, on the next, his criminal record, including convictions for handling stolen goods and shop-breaking. Gibson's modus operandi, or crime speciality, was shown as armed robbery. Yet there were eight policemen among the brethren of the Waterways Lodge at the time Gibson was master. One of them was former Flying Squad Chief Inspector John Brian McNeil, who declined to talk to us. Perhaps these policemen saw no conflict in being in the same lodge as a convicted criminal. If so, they were not alone in this view, as later events proved. Soon after becoming Worshipful Lodge Master, Gibson pulled off one of Britain's biggest ever robberies, the theft of silver bullion worth four million pounds. Three months later, he was arrested, and in January 1981, at the Old Bailey, he was given a ten-year jail term, as were two other Masons in the gang. So what happens to Masons convicted of serious crime? They should be excluded from the institution completely. As far as being Freemasons are concerned, there should be no road back. That is my personal opinion. They should be excluded from the order and never be taken back. Not all of Freemasonry feels that way, for the silver robbers weren't thrown out. Throughout Gibson's five years in jail, he was listed by the Waterways Lodge as a country member. On his release, the Lodge welcomed him back. And even after newspapers revealed that the robbers were Freemasons, the Brotherhood's ruling body, Grand Lodge, decided they could stay in the craft. Then, six weeks ago, Grand Lodge changed course. At a 90-minute hearing, the robbers were allowed to plead their case in front of hundreds of Freemasonry's high and mighty. Most voted against the criminals, so they were expelled, but only after an intense and unprecedented debate. We asked Freemasonry's Grand Secretary what was the argument in favour of the robbers remaining in the Brotherhood. Nothing that uh, really held much water. They felt that they'd repaid their debt to society, um, which I think is probably not quite true. And it's one of those offences if you look at the, the law, it's one that can never be spent. Um, they joined their Freemasonry and they felt they got something to contribute to it. And the Grand Lodge felt that they might have something to contribute, but their presence as convicted robbers was an embarrassment. It took nine years for Grand Lodge to discover that armed robbers performing Masonic rituals alongside police was an embarrassment to the Brotherhood. <laughs>